<clears throat> Here comes the fun part. This is the part you've been waiting on. I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Lauren Wilson. Lauren has been a friend of mine for a while. Probably most of y'all in here know Lauren. Um, she has been a longtime Christian Community Foundation uh, board member. She uh, actually served for 12 years as um, the chairperson of the Wilson Family Fund, which I thought was really neat that she would be on our board but also be involved in her family foundation. So she's done that for a long time. And then she left there and went on a new journey she's going to tell you about. Anything else I tell you about her will steal her story. Come on up, Lauren. While she's coming, though, I do want to tell you about her husband. Behind every good speaker is a good husband. You all know that, right? <laughs> and so um, her husband is the greatest bike rider in the city of Memphis. One day I'm out riding my bike and I get behind a guy. I mean, there's only two of us on the road, okay? I sneak up behind him and his shoulders are this wide and he's like a windsheet. I didn't even know who the guy was and I rode up behind him, saw who it was. I just want to tell y'all, if you ever get stuck on your bike, call her husband, okay? All right, with that, what I love about this young lady the most is that she loves her family and she loves giving. And so she's going to tell you her story. Thank you, Lauren. So I have a little bit of a longer portion of this, but I hope that you will um, take it to heart what I'm saying and hope it will land on you in a way that resonates with you and moves you to do uh, more in your space. But I'm super excited because this is a topic that I absolutely love talking about. I've built kind of a career out of talking about philanthropy and how you approach giving. And I'm pretty fortunate to have a family that really uh, guided me in this uh, career. And so I hope that if anything you hear today um, that you leave with, that you'll think about this, that money is not a dirty word. It's not a secret word. And unfortunately, we often shy away from talking about it. It's really a super important word. It's a word that has incredible meaning and power. As a family, there should be avenues to discuss what you have or what you don't have and how it impacts you and what you should do with it. When I was a little girl, I shied away from our family's story of wealth, and it wasn't something that was discussed openly, but there were plenty of social cues. We had fabulous Christmases. Uh, we were lucky enough to take trips out of the country, and wealth really shaped who I am today, so I'm proud of it. But for a long while, I was really embarrassed by it. I felt um, a little bit guilty, I think, for having the wealth and for not knowing how to share it, but also wanting to shy away from our family's um, position. And I played it down a lot. And I think for me, being embarrassed by it and um, not letting it shape who I was in the moment, it also made me think about how it wasn't fair that we seemed to have access to more. I am grateful I'm raised in a Christian home, but I'll tell you the verse in Luke chapter 12, 48. This is a tough verse for someone um, who lets it land on them. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. If any of you have studied the Enneagram, I did so recently and I uh, learned that I was a two. I don't know where you are on this wheel, but I learned that I was a two, which means I'm a giver and a helper. And then that translates to I'm a doer, and that's a doer for others. And so having more translated for me and doing more. And I dove in to doing so much that I thought that I could do enough. I could maybe share enough, give enough, be enough. But the definition of enough is subjective because as you realize, your variables change every year. It could be um, a health condition, maybe it's a new addition to the family, maybe it's a marriage. All these different things change. And so changes the definition of enough and have I done enough in this moment and in this time. It was my experiences out of the country, oddly enough, on a missions trip in Honduras and separately on another time in a remote village in Tanzania that I got to contemplate, how do you be content with enough? And what does that look like? How do you find joy in finding your enough and making your enough matter? Many of the people that I came across in these villages had defined their enough, so I felt like I should work on my definition. I remember taking the position of the executive director of our family position of our family's um, foundation and realized that there was gonna be no hiding or stepping away from our family story if I took that position. And it turns out a lot of kids who are born into wealth feel the same. 
The City National Bank put out an article last year titled Wealth Guilt. What do you do when your child is ashamed of it? Dr. Gail Gross, a nationally recognized family therapist and psychologist, gives perspective. If parents feel guilty or ambivalent about their financial status, odds are their children will too. Children take their cues from their parents. And she goes on to say that parents who accept their wealth can instill in their child an inner core of confidence. The article reiterates how important it is to explain to children that money is often the byproduct of hard work and dedication. Children mostly see the results of material privilege and not all the decades of the sweat equity that went behind it. A valuable work ethic is by far the most valuable legacy parents can hand down to their children. And I didn't have an advantage of this article years ago. But I do remember that before I accepted the foundation position, I spent one day thinking about my grandparents, and specifically my granddaddy. Many of you know his story of success. Kimmins Wilson's the founder of Holiday Inns. But I spent that day really thinking about his beginnings. His story is riddled with poverty and hardship. He understood hunger. He understood hard work. He understood loss and suffering through war and tragedy. And he understood the love of a single parent. I reflected how his story was like so many of the young people in this city, lacking access to quality education, hungry, craving to be known by a father. But my grandfather used those tough moments in his life to fuel his passion and his curiosity, to fuel his desire for change, to fuel his desire to create a new future. And what I began to reflect on is that he never wanted me, he never wanted his kids, his grandkids, his great grandkids to ever feel the way he did growing up. I remember often that he would comment that one of his proudest accomplishments was knowing how many families were stable as a result of the work of growing the Holiday Inn brand. From laying carpets to furnishing the rooms to painting the walls. It took hundreds of people to build just one hotel and in his prime, the Sunday Times would boast that a new Holiday Inn was being built and open every two and a half days. People succeed together. He understood the power of a gift that kept going on in others. With the gift of the foundation they created, their children were now paying it forward. And here I was, a grandchild, getting a glimpse into the mechanics of how my grandparents preserved hundreds of thousands of dollars to go into the city that they loved the city they believed their children and grandchildren would work in and would believe in as well. The money he cre created for himself and his family, and most importantly for others, was a powerful tool. It's not to be kept a secret, and in fact, it's a precious commodity to be understood and to be protected, and yes, to be shared. As I worked on behalf of the foundation they created, I paid closer attention to how you grow assets and manage grants and create meaningful, intentional giving. Because of my faith, I began to contemplate on this word, beneficiary. It's an interesting word, because usually you begin with a benefactor. It's the person who has the means and the ability to choose who will become beneficiaries. And what's so amazing, what's so amazing about the Christian faith is that we believe that God is the ultimate benefactor. He is the reason that we are here and he chose us to be his beneficiary. And once you understand that you're a beneficiary in this world and that you were given specific gifts that Paul stated in Romans 12, talents to preach, heal, teach, encourage, lead, you must begin thinking about how will you deposit those gifts back into the world. Your identity, these special gifts, once you've accepted them, must be put to use. And here's what's so special. Your mindset will begin to shift once you accept and understand that these gifts were placed inside of you already. Not only are you a beneficiary, but then you become the benefactor. You hold the weight of the responsibility of the gifts you have received. To whom much is given, much is required. There is an action that must take place and there's a faithfulness that is required to manage what we have that's been given with wisdom and selflessness. And all that we have been given to us is by God, right? That means we've been entrusted to receive the special gifts, so we must learn the freedom that Matthew speaks about. Freely you have received, freely give. And I love that scripture speaks directly to this. 
receiving and giving and this people of faith that we have to recognize that the receiving came first and sets in motion the act of giving. My grandparents held the weight of this and thought about my future, not just financially, but prayerfully and with deliberate intent. They set structures in place. They wanted all of us, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and beyond to live up to their best selves. They wanted each of us to have the resources and the opportunities to begin and build on the giving footprint that they began. My parents, thankfully, took hold of what they started and began conversations in our home and created the avenues of giving while modeling for us how to personalize that giving and follow our passions for that giving. A recent study gathered information across the United States and Canada and Europe, and it revealed that families are delivering financial information far too late in life. The study showed that the average age of discussing formal financial education, such as trusts, estates, investments, is 28 years old. And what it also revealed is that a person who has been given wealth, only 20% of those children will, who have inherited wealth will actually die with wealth. 20% is all that will be able to manage it. So that means 80% of people who are given something to manage and give and do something with, all they do is spend it. They have no idea how to steward it, protect it, grow it, share it. They have no idea. They just spend. Giving should be a conversation in the household as early as you have something to give. But it can be something as small and as material as your books, your clothes. It could be a bike. Whatever that looks like, those conversations begin with children in the house. And it also can begin with giving earned money from a bake sale or a lemonade stand. Young people can embrace these practices often better than we do as adults, but it's the practice, the practice of the giving that helps build the framework for giving lifelong. When you live in a Christian mindset, you don't create wealth for just yourself or your family. With humility, you discover it does not fully belong to you. It is the work of so many who have come before you and that you realize you are standing on the shoulders of your ancestors and you are composing now a stance so that others can stand on yours. And in talking about the view, I want to take a little bit of a wide angle look and hopefully help you consider to think about how you're here, why you're in your seat today, and who came before you to pave the way for you to be here. I want to touch on the foresight of those leaders and families who began thinking about what this world needs. And some of you may know this about me, uh, but Tommy and I love to travel around the United States. We found a passion and adventure for it, and we bought an Airstream trailer. And if you know, I'm the daughter of Holiday Inn founder, uh, thinking my granddaddy may not have fully respected our choice in carrying our bedroom on the back of our truck. But I do think that if he had known that the campgrounds were about $12 a night, I could have convinced him to invest in them with me. Um, but our love of travel started as a road trip first in a Chevy Tahoe that we had years ago, and we wanted to see as many national parks as we could. And years down the road, we, road, we purchased the Airstream so that our children could join us. Wilson and Parker are here with me today. And we wanted to take them along, so we've camped our way across East Tennessee, and we've gone as far as the Pacific Northwest and Washington State last year. But one of our favorite places is Wyoming. And there's just something beautiful about it with the Grand Tetons bursting through the horizon as you come around the bend to approach the park. And it's not lost on me, however, as I read about the Tetons and the national parks that we've come to love, that someone before us believed they were worth protecting. Because of the vision of Theodore Roosevelt, we have five national parks, 18 national monuments, 51 bird sanctuaries, an established national wildlife refuge system, along with the fact that he set aside more than 100 million acres for national forests. He understood the need for conversation, con <laughs> excuse me, conservation. He understood the need for conservation in a time when America was rapidly growing its population. Fast forward to the contributions of John D. Rockefeller and his son Lawrence, who chose to expand the national parks and gave more than two million to the Grand Tetons and more than five million to the Great Smoky Mountains here in Tennessee, both of which we and our families enjoy immensely. And I get to benefit from seeing these amazing mountains in a summer. But these are benefactors who chose to make gifts that have lasted long beyond their lifetime and impacted far greater than their families. And wherever you stand on politics, you must recognize the tremendous need we have for grants and gifts to improve, protect, and enhance the places around us. 
It's pretty remarkable to think that my grandfather wanted to go visit the national monuments in DC made possible by the Roosevelts with his five children in tow, only to come home with an idea to build a hotel chain that would change the way that America travels. And because my grandparents loved to travel, they shed that love to my parents, and my parents gave that love to me, and now my family and I experience the full wonder of the most beautifully protected and visited mountains on both sides of this great country, largely made possible by the Rockefellers. Having wealth is not the issue for most of us in this room. The issue is what will we do with it? How will we use it? Acts 20.35 says it's more blessed to give than receive, and I really believe that God God said this because he made us with every bit of purpose that we need inside of us. He equipped us with everything we have to become full of potential. All we have to do is tap in to use it. We are enough. We've been given enough. All we have to say to ourselves is, I am enough. The question to wrestle with is, are we using all of the opportunity and all of the potential that lies within us? Are we tapping into the very resources that he deposited into us to become our best selves or help those to become their best selves? Money's only one of the many tools. If you remember the parable that God speaks to in this, that Christ shares about a man who's given three of his servants the same amount of money. The first two double the money and are given accolades and celebrated and honored for making more. They're told they will be entrusted with more. The third servant however, acts out of fear. He hides his money and sees that he only has the same amount of ret to return to the master he is scolded and called lazy. Lazy. Reflect on that for a minute. Holding on to a gift that's been given to you and hiding it and only to return it to the person who gave it to you. How do you think a benefactor would feel? Better yet, how would you feel? if someone that you gave a gift to returned it to you without using it. In this parable, the servant is acting out of fear and is immobilized to do anything more with what he has. Does that resonate with you? Are you afraid of losing what you have? Has someone told you that you don't have enough? Are you struggling with what the next step is and immobilized with indecision to set up the structures necessary to not just preserve your wealth, but to build on it for a higher purpose? God wants us to act with our faith, and when we do, it empowers us. It propels us to put into action what we believe, and in the end, when we give freely of ourselves and every gift he has equipped us with, we tell his story of blessings, because all that we have really belongs to him. I want to be very clear here. This is not about how much money we have. It's about the talents deposited in us. And for many of these, the talents may not be representative of money. And it's why I love that biblical word, it's talents. Talents are far greater than just a monetary wealth. They're monetary wealth, they are our spiritual gifts. Talents are as powerful as the widow's might. Every gift put into action counts despite what we perceive the size to be. Because with God, we are never, ever measured by the size of our gift, never. We are measured by accepting the gift. He already gave every bit of what we need. God honors the effort every time because he's already determined what our enough looks like, and we just have to own it. Many of you know that I did leave the work of our family foundation. It was a beautiful job, and I loved the job, but I went on to create a family business of our own called Sweet Lala's Bakery. It's a social enterprise that came out of a heart for wanting to work with kids coming out of juvenile court with offenses. Um, it's def definitely difficult to get a job if you have a felony on your record and had a passion for helping teenagers find a new way. And we chose to work with a leading provider of reentry services, an uh, organization called GIF, where I'd served on the board where I discovered the problem in the first place. But we'd contracted with our graduates to produce cookies and we thought we could maybe tell a bigger story through a product. So we leased the GIF kitchen and gave direct revenue for their programming needs while extending their program opportunities through our paid workforce training. And this is why social entrepreneurship is so important to me and should be, hope to you. Um, but it creates a reliable revenue as opposed to relying on grants all the time. And so we told stories, we told a lot of them. Um, we told stories of second chances 
And over the past four years, we worked with just over 80 kids. And the process of baking, for me personally, was a bit of a metaphor. You take this lump of dough, and you beat it, and roll it, and cut it, and you put it through the fire. I began to think about what these boys had gone through in their lives. But out on the other side, after the fire, there's something beautiful about that. There's something amazing, and it was created with a purpose. <clears throat> it's what I believe about the kids at Jeff. And it's not been an easy road to establish a business around a volatile subject, but making sure kids had a chance at living it seemed like the right thing to do. We've told stories of success, and two of the kids here, uh, John on the right and Aaron on the left, are part of my real prideful moments of them. <laughs> but um, we've also had some tough losses. So last year, some of us, or some of you follow me on my Facebook page or our um, bakery page, but we lost four of our student bakers, three to gun violence and one in a high-speed chase. <clears throat> it's heartbreaking and it's humbling to think for all of the effort we still lost. We should never lose a kid in our community this way. But because of my work with nonprofits and my belief and my faith in the God that's bigger than me, I began to think about expanding the brand and I started thinking about this phrase, make life sweeter. Because when it's hard to produce solid results, when it's hard to produce reliable results, I have to remind myself it's the effort. It's not the amount. It's the effort in doing something every day. Do something every day to add a little more kindness, a little more sweetness, a little more of something to make someone believe that they belong in this world. We care about juvenile justice, but we have also learned about so many amazing other organizations and efforts. So we built a brick and mortar store to help tell those other stories. And you'll see just a few of these listed above. I encourage you to go to their websites or come into our store shameless plug, um, to take a look about what they're doing. Um, but many more people are doing amazing things and doing it under a social enterprise to build workforce training and opportunities for those who are marginalized. And I believe in my cup of tea in Thistle and Bee, Shepherd's Haven, Agape North, and Give Good. So we intentionally found those and put them under the umbrella of Make Life Sweeter. And we're committed to telling their stories because we know someone's life can change for the better and get a little sweeter. I know God has had his hand in every bit of it, but we do have to tap in in our own effort and get to work. But today, today's talking about what you have. You absolutely have enough right now to start something. Absolutely have enough. Today is recognizing that very simple truth. You have enough to protect. You have enough to grow, to use, and to share. Have a conversation with your spouse, with your children, or with a friend about where your passions are, and let God nudge you. Let God lead you down a path and let you explore the gifts he's already put inside of you. Look at the talents that are embedded and woven into your very being. Today's a call to action so that each and every one of you recognize that you have something to give. You are all benefactors. So go choose how you will build on it. What you have and the vision you have to change the space around you quite literally might change the space for someone 50 years from now because it already has for us. Think about what around in our own city has been sustained for us, our alma maters, our schools, our museums, our zoos. The very seat that you're sitting in has been bought by someone who chose to give out of abundance before we ever walked into this space. And now it's our turn. The conversation might be difficult at first, but trust me, as you open the door to discuss what you have, and once you believe that it is enough, it will change you. If you are vulnerable enough to remember that nothing truly belongs to us, you will be empowered to share it deeply with those around you. It is exciting to have the Christian Community Foundation here, to have a vehicle to talk about this. There are ways to incorporate your giving with your passions. There's a way to start the dialogue in your house with your kids. And you don't have to be perfect at it. You just have to think about it and do something. So I'm excited that now Ken has even a more exciting announcement about some things and structure that the Christian Community Foundation have been thinking about as a way for you to think about how do you create giving for that next generation. So Ken, thank you for your time. I'm praying for each and every one of you.